My name is Bob Wengren. I'm from Miller Fall Protection. And what we're going to do today is we're going to do a presentation on fall protection. Now, a couple things that I want to discuss ahead of time. When you talk about personal fall protection, you're not talking about this harness I'm wearing. You're not talking about any individual item laying here or that's up here connected. It's a system. It's a system composed of three components. Are you familiar with the ABCs of fall protection? Does anybody have any idea what that is? You guys do use this, right? There you go. A is your anchor point, what you actually tie to. B is your body wear, your harness. And C is your connecting device, either your shock absorbing lanyard or retractable lifeline. All three components are equally as important. If you take one of the three away, none of it works. You know, I've been on a lot of job sites where people have said to me, oh, they keep harping on me. I got to wear my harness, got to wear my harness. Well, sure you do. But just because I have this harness on, does this now magically mean that I can't fall? No. All it is is one, it's not anti-gravity. It's no more than one part of the system. If I don't have something to tie myself off with or some, something substantial to tie it to, does it really matter I have a harness on? In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. A couple years ago, I don't know if you guys remember or not, but there was a guy that fell through a roof in um, Ambridge and got killed. I, the day that happened, I got called to go out to that job because they shut it down. All right, And I'm out there the next day, and, and I'm in this meeting with the general manager and these two contractors, and I asked them what happened. They said, well, they had these corrugated panels that had asbestos in them, that they had an abatement contractor removing them. The guy takes the screws out of the panel, he picks up the panel, he steps back, he went 50 foot through a skylight and it killed him. He was 20 years old. He had a harness on, he had a lanyard on, and three feet away from him was the rope lifeline and rope grab that he was supposed to have been tied to that he didn't tie to. So the point here is just because you have it around you in a job box or in a trailer, it doesn't do you any good unless you're actually using all three. So. Based on that, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about all three components of personal fall protection, and I'm actually going to show you some demonstrations on it. We're going to start with your harness, your body wear. We're going to talk, I'm going to remind you of some certain things, proper adjustment, inspection, that sort of thing. Then we're going to show you some drops. I'm going to actually do three different drops. One into a non-shock absorbing lanyard, one into a shock absorbing lanyard, and a third into a retractable lifeline. So you can see how the forces react to all three, and then we can discuss when you want to use one versus the other. And then we're going to finish this up with talking about your anchor point. What, it, what constitutes an anchor point and the proper way to connect to that? And again, if you have any questions while we're going through this, please don't hesitate. Put your hand up and stop me and ask me. This is extremely important. This literally can save your life. Let's start with your harness. Now, I know you guys have worn harnesses, you know how to put them on and all that good stuff, but there's some things I want to remind you about. All harnesses have a chest strap. The purpose of the chest strap, there's two functions that a chest strap has. One is for comfort, so these shoulders are not falling off like suspenders. And the other reason for having this is that if you took a head first fall, it keeps the harness from opening up and you falling out of the harness. This can be as loose or as tight as you want, somewhere in the mid chest range, but you need to buckle this. Now, how many times have you seen somebody walking around with the leg straps on their harness like this? If you fell with your leg straps like this, what's going to happen to you? You're probably better off hooking the lanyard to your t-shirt because your t-shirt probably has a better chance of stopping you. If this chest strap doesn't hang you, this is going to pull right off your head and you're going to go through it. I've seen people buckle them behind like two tails flapping in the wind to try and fool you. The problem is you're only fooling yourself. You need to buckle your leg straps. So you buckle your leg straps. Now this isn't going to happen with this because I've already adjusted it for me. But I want to show you something. How many times have you buckled your leg straps or seen people with their leg straps buckled and they're hanging down around their knees? If you fell with your leg straps by your knees, again, what do you think is going to happen to you? 
your voice is going to go up about eight octaves is what's going to happen to you. It's not designed to be worn by your knees. Okay? If you're harnessed, you put it on your leg straps or by your knees. What do you think you need to do to fix that? How do you think you need to adjust that? Adjust your leg strap? That's what most people say. Well, the reality of it is, that's not what you need to do. What you actually need to do is adjust your shoulder straps. See, because your shoulder straps adjust how long the, the harness is. So when you tighten your shoulder straps, it pulls the leg straps up to where they're supposed to be. Okay? Now they're where they're supposed to be. How tight should they be? Well, again, you don't want them so loose that they're flapping in the wind, but on the other hand, you don't want them so tight that you're all bound up and you're walking like this all day. A good rule of thumb is the finger test. If I can put my fingers through here, that's tight enough. If I can put my fist through it, it's too loose. Fingers. Okay? One other thing I want to remind you about. All harnesses have a D-ring in the back. This is the only place you would ever attach either your six-foot shock-absorbing lanyard or your retractable lifeline to. If you have a harness with additional D-rings in it, either front D-rings or side D-rings, those are for positioning applications only. Under no circumstances would you ever attach your six-foot shock-absorbing lanyard or retractable lifeline to any other D-ring but the one in your back. Think about this. This is the spot in your body where you're naturally designed to have a fall arrested from or picked up from. Do you ever pick up a cat or your kids by the scruff of the neck? That's what you look like in a harness. You're literally picked up by the scruff of your neck. If you're tied off here, this is not a natural way to fall, or here. That's not a natural way to have a fall arrested. So you guys understand this. Front D-rings have two applications. One of them is for positioning for example, a ladder climbing system. You're attached to the ladder about that far, you climb up and down the ladder, if you fall past parallel, it stops you. The other reason for having a front D-ring is for raising and lowering into a confined space in a work situation. In other words, you're gonna be lowered in and you're gonna sit in the big swing and you're gonna get lowered down. When you're done, they're gonna lift you back up. You do not wanna use a front D-ring for a confined space rescue because if you're unconscious, your tendency is that if you're being pulled this way, your head will slip forward and your shoulders are slope and you'll come straight out of the manhole. If you're tied here what, and you're unconscious, what's your tendency? Is you're gonna lay back like this and they're not gonna get you out of the space. Side D rings are used again for positioning applications, tying rebar, working on forms. <coughs> Excuse me. Think about someone climbing a utility pole. That's a classic example of being positioned. You got your cleats dug into the pole, your lineman's belt, your pole strap, you're leaning back hands free and you're working on the lines. That's all that they're for. And I've had a lot of people over the years tell me, well, I'd like a harness with everything on it so no matter what situation I get into, I'm covered. I have to recommend against that. Because what happens is you're adding cost to the harness, you're adding weight to the harness, but more importantly, you're giving people the opportunity to do the wrong thing. If I got a front D-ring on my harness and nobody ever told me I can't tie to it, boy, it's a heck of a lot easier to do this than to try and reach back here. I'm doing it. Okay? One other thing I want to make sure I mention to you. Every harness has this strap in it. See the strap right here? That's called a sub-pelvic strap. The purpose of that strap is if you, if you fall and you're suspended in the air, it acts like a seat or a swing. If you didn't have that strap in the harness and you were suspended in the air, these leg straps would literally choke your legs. It would be extremely uncomfortable to hang there for any period of time. The reason that I'm showing you this is that when you adjust your harness, you need to make it a habit that you reach back and slide this below your butt. I've seen people cinch these harnesses up so tight that that strap ends up in the small of your back. Well, if that's where it is and you fall, it's not going to do you any good. Make sure it's in the right position. All right, now, one last thing about the harnesses. It's your obligation as the wearer of a harness to do a visual inspection prior to each time you put it on. Now, don't let that scare you. It's not that big of a deal. Look at the harness. Look for things that are very straightforward. Look at the webbing. Look for cuts, frays, burns, tears, that sort of thing. If you hold your harness up 
and it looks like Swiss cheese because weld splatters hit it, don't wear it. But if you've got a little hard spot on it, and you can't see through it, no, not, no fibers are broken, it's fine. Make sure the buckles buckle. Make sure if you've got grommeted legs, the grommets aren't pulled out. Make sure the D-rings aren't cracked, corroded, that sort of thing. It's very common sense things you're looking for. But one thing I do want to mention to you, even though I'm telling you that you need to inspect this every time you put it on, I know and you know that's probably not going to happen, is it? You're going to be in a hurry. You're going to grab it. You're going to put it on. I'll look at it later. Somebody else looked at it. Well, knowing this, if you put a harness on and something catches your eye that puts some doubt into your mind on whether or not you should continue to wear the harness, because you're not looking at it all the time, if it's bad enough to get your attention, it's probably pretty bad. Don't wear it. It's your life you're talking about. I mean, kids pay more for a pair of tennis shoes nowadays than they do in harness costs, and I have yet to see a pair of tennis shoes that could save your life. Get a new harness. All right, now let's get into some action here. Again, what I have up in the air here, this is a 220 pound weight. It's a bag full of sand. The reason it's 220 pounds is that all of the OSHA standards are based on a 220 pound weight dropped six feet. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I weigh more than that, so it's not a good representation of me. Well, what you have to understand is 220 pound dead weight is equal to a 310 pound person because dead weight is heavier than live weight. So what you are going to see is the equivalent of a 310 pound person taking all three of these falls. Now, the first drop I'm going to do is into a six foot web lanyard. It's a non-shock absorbing lanyard. There's a couple things I want you to watch when I drop this. I want you to watch the bag, I want you to watch the trailer, and we'll talk about this for a minute. What happened is, person takes the fall, six foot fall, hits the end of the line. You saw how much force there was. The bag bounced, the whole trailer bounced. Because what happened was, when that bag hit the end of the line, that was approximately 2,800 pounds of force that that person would have experienced. It bounced. Now, people think that when you bounce, it's going to cushion the fall. Think of like a bungee cord. You're going to bounce, and it's going to be cushiony, and it's not going to hurt as bad. Well, reality of the situation is, when you hit the end of a line and you bounce, you have to hit the end of the end again, right? Every time you hit, that's additional force you put on your body. So that first hit was about 2,800 pounds of force. It bounced up about a foot or so, right? It hit the second time. That second shot was about 1,800 pounds of force. It bounced again, then it was about eight or 900. And then it bounced a little bit. So the point is, if you fell on this job site, would you necessarily want to be bouncing around? I, I wouldn't think so. And the other thing is, that was 2,800 pounds of force. The OSHA standard is very clear. If you take a fall into a full body harness, the maximum force you're allowed to, to have your body experience is 1,800 pounds of force. This drop that you just saw with this six foot non-shock absorbing lanyard is illegal to use right now. You cannot do this. But the purpose of me dropping that first was to give you a baseline so that you can see what you cannot do so that you can see the difference for what you can. Guys, let me ask you a question. On this ladder, do I, do I legally need to use fall protection on this ladder? Yeah, no, I'm not sure. Well, think about this. This is a fixed vertical ladder. To meet the ladder standard, if this is 24 foot or longer in a continuous run, I would need to use fall protection while I'm physically standing on this ladder. Is this ladder 24 feet? No. But am I going to use this just as a means to access another level, or am I actually going to use it as a work platform? I'm going to be working off of it, right? 
I may not be able to maintain three points of contact. Therefore, I'm going to be above six feet off the ground. I need to use some external means of fall protection. And, the, what I, and why I'm doing this and why I'm even talking about this is because a lot of times if you don't pre-plan what you're going to do, it can be a nuisance, it can be cumbersome, it can slow you down. But if I didn't have anything on, I'd jump up and climb this ladder, right? But I've already pre-planned how I'm going to do it. So now I'm jumping up, I'm making a connection and climbing it. How much time is that taking to do that? Is it really slowing me down? That's why it's important that if you pre-plan what you're going to do, it doesn't not, there's no way, there's no need for it to slow you down. But you can be safe. So I just want to make that point while I was connecting this. Okay, now we're going to do the same drop, 220 pound weight, six foot drop, into a shock absorbing lanyard. Now, this time when the bag falls, again, I want you to watch the bag, I want you to watch the trailer, and we'll talk about the difference. It didn't bounce like it did before, did it? The trailer didn't bounce like it did before, did it? But it went a lot further, didn't it? There are two key things that you need to know about shock absorbing lanyards. Number one, if you fell into one, they can rip out, in this case, or stretch out up to 42 inches, three and a half feet beyond their initial six foot length. So in other words, this lanyard that was six foot long to begin with, if I fell into it, potentially could be nine and a half feet long. You need to know that. The second thing you need to know is that when my fall is arrested using this shock absorbing lanyard, the maximum force my body's ever going to see is 900 pounds. So there's two key things you need to know. Three and a half foot of stretch, 900 pounds of force. Now we're gonna do one more drop. A Couple things I want you to notice. I didn't put the bag up as high, did I? There's a reason for that you'll see in a minute. But again, watch the bag this time, and we'll talk about this. How far did you go? Not very far, did you? There are two key things that you need to know about retractable lifelines. Number one, is if you fell into a retractable, the braking mechanism in inertia is an inertia brake. It's based on speed, not a person's weight. So if you're moving at a normal pace, nothing happens, okay? But it's, nothing normally happens, nothing happens. But as soon as you were to run or fall, it'll activate. Once you go four and a half feet per second, the brakes pause come out and it stops you. By doing this, again, the maximum force your body's ever going to see is 900 pounds. So you see, again, the end result's the same. 900 pounds of force, there's just two different ways to go about doing it. The shock absorbing lanyard, you free fall six feet, you generate X amount of force. It activates, it slows you down. It's like putting the brakes on in your car so that when, you're, when your fall is arrested, the forces are reduced back on you to no more than 900 pounds. The retractable lets you freely move around. And if you fell four and a half feet per second, you fall, it has to arrest your fall within two feet, which it does. By doing that, it stops you before the forces exceed 900 pounds. Okay, so the end result's the same, no matter which one you use, but when would you want to use one versus the other one? 
Well, what determines that is your available fall distance. If you're a six foot tall person and you're using a six foot shock absorbing lanyard, the minimum distance your anchor point needs to be, not necessarily from the ground, but from the nearest obstruction beneath you, is 18 and a half feet. Okay, well, how do you come up with that? Well, you got the person's height, six foot. You got the original length of your lanyard, six foot. That's 12 feet. How far did we say these can rip out? Three and a half feet? That's 15 and a half feet. If that's where my anchor point is, my feet hit the ground. Can I get a little close? So you put a three foot safety factor in so you don't hit the ground and to allow for any deflection you might have in your anchor point. That's 18 and a half feet. All right, now, if you're on a job out here and you're 50 feet off the ground and there's little clutter around you, little stuff around you, is that an issue? Maybe, maybe not. But go into a steel mill or chemical plant or power generation facility. There's a lot of stuff around you, right? You're hard pressed to find an area where you have an 18 and a half foot unobstructed free fall. Now, go back to what I just said for a minute about being 50 foot off the ground, there's little stuff around you. Let me give you a scenario. Let's say I'm standing on a, on a brand new building on bare steel. I'm three floors up. Story of a building's 10 foot, okay? The second floor below me, there's no floor in. It's just bare steel. So the nearest obstruction beneath me now is the ground. Story of a building's 10 feet. I'm on the third floor. My feet are 30 feet off the ground. You follow me? We put up stanchions, string a cable that's another four feet up. I hook my shock absorbing lanyard to this. My anchor point is 34 feet from the ground. I hook to it. I start doing what my doing work, right? While I'm working, they start setting the deck pans on the second floor below me. It's now two hours later. I haven't moved. I still have my lanyard in that place, but now my free fall distance went from 34 feet to 14 feet. This lanyard that would have worked two hours ago no longer will work. So arguably a construction site is the most challenging from a fall arrest standpoint because it's constantly changing. You know if you worked in a, in a chemical plant for example and somebody there was a spot 10 feet up in the air that you had to do routine maintenance on once a week and you knew when you were in that spot you had to use fall protection 15 years from now if it's you or somebody else that goes there they know when they're in that spot they've established the anchor point you got to do it but here it's always changing it's changing hourly let alone daily that's why it's such a challenge and that's why you need to know retractables will work virtually any place you go the shock absorbing lanyards don't necessarily the last thing we're going to talk about is your anchor point. Now, I know I said earlier that all three components are equally as important. Well, technically, that's true. Realistically, your anchor point is the most important thing we're going to talk about. From the simple standpoint that most people don't do this right. I've lost track of how many times I've seen someone about to go in the air like this and I'll say to them, hey, when you go up in the air, what are you going to tie to? And they look at you and they say, I don't know. All right, well, if you find something substantial to tie to, how are you going to tie to it? They look at you and they say, I don't know. Well, what do you think is going to happen? <coughs> something magically appears from the sky you can tie to just because you have these two things on? Well, I got news for you. If you think that's the case, it's not the case. Just so you guys understand, according to OSHA, an anchor point needs to be able to do one of two things either one be able to hold a 5,000 pound vertical pull. That's where most people stop. They get fixated on a 5,000 pound anchor point. They never read the next line of the standard which says or a two to one safety factor. All right well what does that mean? Well let me give you a quiz. If you were to fall into a shock absorbing lanyard or retractable lifeline what's the maximum force your body is going to see? 900 pounds, right? Here's your math test. Double that. 1,800 pounds. If you're wearing a harness, shock-absorbing lanyard, or retractable lifeline, 
and your anchor point is capable of holding 1,800 pounds or more, that is also an acceptable anchor point. Okay, now that opens up a lot more possibilities, doesn't it? But now the issue becomes, how do I know what I'm going to attach to can hold 5,000 pounds or 3,600 pounds or 1,800 pounds? I mean, realistically, do you know that? The only way you'd ever know it for certain is if you had a structural engineer come on the job every day and certify areas you can tie off to every day. I'm going to go way out on a limb and say, I don't think that's going to happen. However, there's a rule of thumb you can use when you're looking to establish an anchor point. Look for things that are structural. I-beams, columns, channels, floors, roof trusses. If you've got a roof truss that can hold a snow load in, in the northeast, it certainly can hold you if you fall. But things you want to avoid are things like conduit, PVC pipe, light cross bracing, power lines, fences, handrail. If you guys realize a handrail only has to hold a 200 pound side load or down load. That's it. Well, here's my shock absorbing lanyard, right? 900 pounds of force, right? If I tied this to a handrail and I fell, what's going to happen to me? Yeah, I'm like Wiley e. Coyote, right? I'm going to hit the ground and the handrail is going to land on top of me. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you a handrail can never be an anchor point. Oh, they can be. I've seen some in some steel mills that were engineered and fabricated that are. But what you guys have to realize, 99% of them are not. And I can tell you this, I don't care how good of a carpenter you are, a 2x4 handrail is never going to be an anchor point for fall protection. Okay, now, I'm up in the air. I got an I-beam here that I feel very comfortable is going to hold me. Here's my lanyard. How do I tie to it? Can I do this? Why not? Why can't I do this? You know, it's interesting. I, I've asked that question probably a thousand times, literally a thousand times. And I get the same response. Oh, you can't do it. And I'll ask why, and it gets a lot quieter. Well, I'll answer my own question. Can I do this? Yeah, I can do it, because I just did it. And I'm not going to put anybody on the spot here, but I bet you somebody standing here at some point has done this with a lanyard. This is a very common way that people tie off. People have been using lanyards like this <coughs> excuse me, since the beginning of using fall protection. But what I also want to tell you is, this is the absolute worst thing you could ever do. Far and away the worst. There are three very clear reasons why you can't choke a lanyard off. The first reason is when you choke a lanyard off, you dramatically weaken it. Are any of you familiar with slings? If you're familiar with slings, you know a sling is much stronger in a straight lift than a choke lift, right? Okay, what's the difference? Straight lift, choke lift. You're looking at a 30% reduction in strength right now, brand new out of the bag when you choke this off. The second problem you have when you choke this off, when you drag this over things, it's going to cut it, it's going to fray it. There's nothing to protect this. So it's going to wear it out quicker, but more importantly, increase the odds that if you actually fell into this, it's going to break. But the third issue is arguably the most important one, snap hooks. And not just our snap hook, any manufacturer snap hook. So you guys understand, for this snap hook to meet the OSHA specifications, this has to be able to hold 5,000 pounds of force in this direction. Does anybody have any idea what this gate opening has to hold? 350 pounds. Front load or side load? That's it. Well, here's my shock absorbing lanyard, right? 900 pounds of force, right? I take this thing, I choke it off, I fall and it drapes over the gate. You got 900 pounds, 350, 350. What are you going to do to the gate? Tear it open, right? What if you choke this thing around a beam and the flange of the beam butts up against the gate and you fall? The flange smashes it. You hit the ground. So for those three reasons, you never, 
ever, under any circumstances, take a lanyard like this, wrap it around something, and choke it off on itself. What you're supposed to do is use something like I've been using up here, a cross arm strap. Take that and wrap it around the structural member and hook it to it. All right, so we're clear on that, right? You understand that, right? Well, guess what? People are still going to choke this off. You know why? Well, I don't have one of those. Or I do, but I forgot it. Or I don't want to carry it. There's, uh, there's a ton of excuses why people aren't going to do it. Knowing this, this lanyard was created about eight years ago. This is called a backbiter. This lanyard is actually designed to be choked off on itself. Now, remember the three things we just talked about with this one. The first thing I want to show you is look at this snap hook. This snap hook is 5,000 pounds all the way around, including the gate. So in essence, when this is closed, there's no difference between this or the D-ring on my harness. It works the same way as the other end does. This webbing, it's Cordura nylon. That's what slings are made out of. This is five times more abrasion resistant than this type of webbing. So it's designed to take the abuse of dragging over things. <clears throat> in addition to that, there's two red wear threads in here. So if you're, they're exposed, like a sling, you know it's time to replace it. This webbing is 12,000 pound tensile strength. This webbing is 7,000 pound tensile strength. This is stronger in a choke pull than this is in a straight pull. So, you can take the backbiter here, wrap it around any structural member, choke it off, and it's perfectly safe to do it. If you haven't already guessed, this is a very popular type of lanyard for a number of reasons. One of them is you're taking a common, unsafe work practice and making it safe. We're not asking you to carry anything else, but just switch to this and you can do what you've always done and it's safe. But the other advantage of this is if you've got something that's so large that you wrap this around it, it leaves you with that much lanyard, there's no reason why you couldn't wrap the cross arm strap around it and hook this to it. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay? Now, that's all well and good. Cross arm straps are great, backbiter's great, but you can't always wrap around something. Well, there's a whole variety of things you can do as far as anchor points. Lifeline systems, um, temporary or horizontal lifelines, but these are some of the popular ones that I would think you'd be using on this job site. Ones like this with the rebar hook. I know that the lanyards you use are a two-legged version of a lanyard with rebar hooks on the ends. These rebar hooks give you more flexibility for tying off because this has a two and a half inch throat opening versus a three quarter inch throat opening. So this gives you the ability to connect around angle iron, a pipe, rungs of ladders, things like that, holes and flanges that this little one won't. But one thing I do want to caution you on is that, see this gate opening? See how much bigger it is? It's still only 350 pounds. This is even more dangerous to choke this off than the small one because you have so much more gate opening to grab. There's also things like this, beam anchors. They fit on one exposed flange of an I-beam, either above you or below you. Push the button, adjust it for the flange width, pop it in, hook yourself to it, it'll slide the flange with you. You want to take it off, push the button, take it off. There's also a version of this that will fit on a vertical column. The difference is there's a torque on the side so it'll snug the flange and this D-ring instead of being in the center is on the side. Because if you left it in the center and you fell it's going to want to pull it down the flange. If it's on the side and you fall it's going to torque it into it. Maybe this would help. It's also things like this. Push through eye bolts. This fits in a standard bolt hole in structural steel. Pull the trigger, stick it in the hole, let it go, there's your anchor point. When you're done, pull the trigger, take it out, put it somewhere else. It's the same principle as a drywall anchor, except don't stick it in drywall. It's not going to hold you. Then there's even some unique things, things like this. This is called a Miller grip. This is a temporary, reusable concrete anchor. You need three things for this to work. You need to have cured concrete, 
that's 3,000 PSI and that's solid. It's got to be solid. It can't be a foundation block. It can't be a mortar joint. Drill a three-quarter inch diameter hole, three inches deep, clean the hole out, pull the plunger back, stick it in the hole, let it go. You've got a 5,000 pound anchor point. When you're finished, pull the plunger, take it out, <coughs> take it with you, reuse it. You don't have to epoxy it in. You don't have to leave it in the elements. You plunge it in, plunge it out, and take it with you. This is the same principle as those Chinese finger cups. When you put this in the, in the hole, the harder you would pull on this loop, the tighter this thing would seat itself. Until you actually pull this plunger back to release these spoons, you're not going to get this out. So, again, there's a whole variety of things you can do for anchorage connectors, but first off, you have to have the proper thing to tie to and then figure out the proper way to attach to it. Just to review, we talked about the ABCs of fall protection, right? And we started with the B part of it, your body wear, with your harness. And we talked about the proper way to put your harness on, what the proper use of the D-rings are, and how to inspect it. Then we talked about the connecting parts of it, the shock absorbing lanyard versus the retractable lifeline, and when you'd use one versus the other. And then we finished with talking about the, the A part of it, your anch the anchor point. What's a con what constitutes an acceptable anchor point and then proper ways to attach to it. Does anybody have any questions on anything that we covered here today? Yes. All right. The question was, what's the purpose of this extra metal loop on here? Well, and I think I saw this coming in here. What tends to happen is people have their lanyard on, right? And they want to use a, a, a retractable like this. So they take this off, they take that retractable, and they put the two hooks together. You know you can't do that, right? It's illegal to do that. There's two reasons why you can't do this. Number one, these are not compatible connections. Neither one of them is a complete 5,000 pounds. So that's illegal to put two snap hooks together. But then the other reason it's illegal, well, you don't want to do it, is you eliminate the advantage of the retractable. Why are you using the retractable in the first place? Well, so you can move around a bigger area, but if you fall, it catches you right now. Well, guess what? If you hook your lanyard to it and you fall, the retractable stops you, but then you got your six foot fall and your three and a half foot of rip out that you're trying to avoid in the first place by using the retractable. So it's one or the other. So what happens is people tend, they want to do this. So what this is, this is an extension. See what I have on me right now that I've been clipping off to here? This is actually an extension of my D-ring that I can make it easier to access to. So I don't have to be reaching back here all the time. What this is, is what you see here sewn on top of this here. So what happens is this part is attached to my regular D-ring and I'm using my lanyard. I want to transition to a retractable. So I take the lanyard, I flip it over my shoulder, here's the O-ring, I pull the retractable down, hook it to it. If I fell into this, this pack does not activate because this is an extension, just like I have on me, sewn on top. All this is doing is making it easier to access your D-ring without removing your lanyard. And you want to transition back, you just unhook your retractable, flip this back over your shoulder, and you're using your lanyard again. This is available on any lanyard that we have. That's why that's on here. Okay? Right. Once, once, the, once the shock absorber is activated, it's done. Okay? Now, that same thing applies to the harnesses and the anchor points. Anything that's seen a fall, you want to replace it. It's done. And one of the things that we've recently done with the harnesses, because it's always been tough to get a good indicator on whether a harness has seen a fall or not, on the back of this, see this pad on the back? It's where the D-ring, the webbing comes through it, and the D-ring's right in the middle here. There's two slots, in the, you can't see it right now, but they're on either side here. What they are are actually fall indicators. If you were to fall, what happens is this middle piece will break. The harness isn't going to break. You're not going to hit the ground. It'll break out. So you'll be able to look at the harness and you'll see this piece folded out. 
and you'll know that it's seen a fall and you need to take it out of service. The shock, the retractables have indicators. This particular one, it's right here. See how it's mushroomed up? That has not seen a fall. If you were to fall into this, what would happen is this would flatten out and you'd see bright red around it. If you see bright red around it, you know it's seen a fall, you can't use it. If you're using like this webbing one, like the Scorpion, the fall indicator is right here. It's stitched over. If you fell, the stitching rips out and there's a big red flag that comes out, very visual. Can't use it, okay? So yeah, anything that's seen a fall, you need to take it out of service. If there's no other questions, there's just one last thing I want to leave you with. If you got nothing else from this presentation, <clears throat> keep one thing in mind. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Well, you're not doing it because the job requires you to do it. You're not doing it because it's a company policy. You're not doing it because it's an OSHA standard. You're not doing this to make your life miserable or your job a hassle. There's only one reason you're doing this. It's so that when you come to work at the beginning of the day, you're going to have dinner with your family tonight. Falls are the number one cause of fatalities in construction. Falls are the number two cause of fatalities in the entire workforce in the United States right now behind only auto accidents. That's why you're doing this. Nothing more to make sure that you're going to go home to your family tonight. Keep that in mind. Miller Fall Protection manufactures the most extensive line of fall protection, work positioning, travel restraint, and rescue products, including products that meet the new ANSI Z359 standards. The new Miller 3.6K snap hooks and carabiners are proof tested and meet the new ANSI Z359.1-2007 standard. However, this new standard also impacts other fall protection products, including shock absorbing lanyards, double legged shock absorbing lanyards, harnesses with front D-rings, self retracting lifelines, anchorage connectors, carabiners, vertical lifelines, positioning and restraint lanyards, positioning assemblies, man rated winches, self retracting lifelines with retrieval. Miller is your one source provider for all fall protection products that meet all applicable standards.